What we're trying to do ultimately actually is uh, avoid mindsets like Mel Gibson. Uh, you know, so that people get stopped on highways, don't start blurting out uh, their inner feelings about what they've been taught when they were young. Because uh, uh, the outer self uh, can gloss it over with uh, slogans and everything else. But unfortunately, um, it's not his fault, really. I blame his parents. <laughs> and the whole history of Western culture behind them. But um, it's not just, uh, you know, it, 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 you know a, a jerk's a jerk. And uh, it'll come out in the end, uh, sadly, for him and all, and all the rest of us. But, um, you know, some, someone pumped that sort of thing into his brain when he was young. And uh, he's not a big enough intellectually minded person. So he's basically on the same uh, level as uh, Ahmadinejad in Iran. He says the same kinds of things as Ahmadinejad. But where do those things come from? Well, unfortunately, we'll see that come from scripture a lot. And uh, they shouldn't be there because Jesus, of course, would not approve of them. And uh, again, I apologize to begin with the class about this, but if I, I didn't, I don't think I said that if things were done in his name that were not his, then he would expect you to find out about that and do something about it. And I think one thing that certainly was not his was hatred of his own people. So if that has somehow bubbled up in someone's mind in some odd fashion, some weird manner, that's the numero, that's the first thing that would be, uh, he would require you. And you can't then go to whatever gate you're uh, approaching and say, oh, well, uh, I didn't know about that, and uh, I didn't think that was a problem. You know, uh, I believed in the documents that I was encountered. Okay, but when you're, uh, as Paul said, when you're a, a child, you see things as a child and through a glass darkly, but when you grow up, you put aside childish things. And particularly if you're in an intellectual environment and you're not... Um, you're not on the level of a bar fly or something, uh, then, uh, <laughs> then, then, then it is incumbent on you to, uh, to do your best to wrestle with problems. And again, this is probably the, one of the crucial issues in Western civilization. I'm not trying to overdo it. But look at Ahmadinejad, in case you don't know who he is, the Prime Minister of Iran. I mean, he's spouting classical classical, um, I don't want to label it with any particular name, uh, racist remarks, classical, you know, and, and he said, well, how come? How could it go all the way to that? Well, I teach the Quran, and I don't want to upset anyone in the room who is a Muslim, but Muhammad is a good poet, really good poet. Let's put the angel theory aside. I mean, we don't credit angels dictating things to human beings in, on a college campus. You can credit that in religious institutions, mosques, synagogues, churches, whatever. And uh, as I've said very often in classes, you know, if I were to come to you in the uh, school cafeteria and say, uh, hey, you know, I met an angel on the way up to class uh, today, and he told me this, that, and the other thing, I mean, You'd be on your way. You, you, if I was next to you in the next table and I came up to you and started telling you how I encountered an angel and he told me to do certain things, you'd sort of like move away from me. And you'd think I was ready for the, for the uh, well, at least the investigatory uh, uh, agency in terms of psychic uh, problems. That's the thing. What we today in the modern world would think is psychological disturbance or overreaching or um, you know um, whatever you want to call it trauma in those days was considered a religious uh, um, event so uh, you have to distinguish between these two things and say well how come people are seeing angels everywhere and how come they don't see them today, per se? Well, because I think psychic phenomenon was expressed in those terms back then. 
and we don't really credit it in the university anyway. So um, I put aside those who say the Quran is dictated to the prophet by an angel. You know, uh, that's that really is another form of saying, like the Greek said, that the muse has inspired me. But um, even the angel he encounters, by the way, and I'm not trying to attack Islam, I'm just talking about the way I would talk about any religion, is an uh, Old Testament angel. Who's the angel that he encounters that supposedly dictates this to Gabriel. Gabriel. Sometimes it's called Gabriel in the Quran, other times it's called the Holy Spirit. He actually calls it the Holy Spirit. Sometimes he calls it Gabriel. Well, <laughs> unfortunately for the whole uh, Islamic world, Gabriel is a Jewish angel. I mean, it comes out of Jewish literature. Where's the first book that uh, Gabriel uh, emerges from? You, any Christians in the room should know this because it's a very precious book to Christians. Daniel, book of Daniel. But in Daniel, Gabriel, Jabril as the uh, Muslims call him, is not a revelationary angel. He doesn't, he's not, he doesn't give revelations. Daniel has the revelation and Gabriel interprets it for him. Gabriel is the interpreter of revelation. He's not the revealer of revelation. Now ultimately, as history progressed six, seven, eight centuries down the pipeline, these two things coalesced into one, and by the time of the Quran, Gabriel is the revealer of, uh, of uh, revelations. But at the time of Daniel, where we first encounter Gabriel, Daniel sees him on the other side of the river, and Gabriel says to him, uh, Daniel, uh, that vision which you just had, here's what the meaning is. And he goes and tells him what the, what the meaning is in terms of the various he goats, she goats, uh, rams, uh, different animals that Gabriel saw, and what the kings are, and so on. And so he just interprets Daniel's uh, visionary experience for him. In any event, uh, whatever, whatever you want to say about Muhammad and his uh, revelationary experiences, and I don't believe in respecting any religion if it um, if it um, has some flaws that need to be pointed out. I mean, you've got to, if flaws are, are causing people to act monstrously or oddly, then you, you have a right to. You can, oh, I respect your religion, you respect, no, 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 no. You know, in a university we don't respect any um, anything, as uh, Descartes said, that we cannot so subject to systematic doubt. You know, you say, what are you talking about, I mean, Well, I'm just uh, rambling about some background things, but we live in a Cartesian universe. Any of you who are in the sciences, mathematics, computer science, and so on, know that basically you and uh, uh, Descartes and Newton created the modern intellectual world as we, uh, as we use it, and maybe Leibniz thrown in. He claims that he invented the calculus before Newton did. But they invented the calculus around the same time. He's telling, what's the calculus? How many people in here know what the calculus is? Well, the calculus makes things go in the modern world. Without the calculus, you wouldn't even set off on, uh, an, on an airplane trip. I mean, it, uh, it's the most powerful tool that, uh, that's ever been invented. And it was invented in the 17th century literally was invented by these three people. You know, when you're taking high school uh, mathematics, you might recall you use Cartesian coordinates. That's Descartes. He's a French philosopher, and he was functioning around the same time as uh, Newton and Leibniz. In any case, we in the university live in their universe. We'll live in some other universe. And what did Descartes say? I want to find a first principle. I want to find a first principle of truth. In order to do that, what did he say that he was going to do? Get rid of anything that has any sense of doubt. He was going to doubt everything, everything that he could doubt. Everything that he could doubt. Uh, that, uh, you've got a nice ring there, man. Uh, you could do a concert series with that. Uh, he was going to do systematically, systematic doubt at school. So he ended up throwing everything out that he couldn't prove, that he couldn't prove. This is what we're based on in the Western intellectual world. So when people come and visit here and they say, oh, why don't you respect our tradition? We do insofar as you're willing 
to uh, you know follow the basic assumptions of the modern universe. We do, but where are we? But where you don't, then we're going to question it, and we should insist that that's done, because otherwise our civilization is going to crumble. The one that we know, and we're going to go back to the Middle Ages. So in any case, um, I don't think it's going to happen. But as I already told you, I think under nuclear threat, some terrible things may happen. But I don't think that one is necessarily going to happen in the West. But the point is that this respecting of different traditions without any criticism can go too far. Now, the criticism shouldn't be harsh, and it shouldn't be uh, uh, centered on any one, and it shouldn't be prejudiced. It should just be universally applied like Descartes. Uh, so what did Descartes finally end up with? There was one thing he said he couldn't doubt. What was that? Yeah, yeah but what was it in English terms? I think therefore I am. He said, I can't doubt that I am. I can't doubt that I am. Some people can say, yes, you can doubt that too. I can't doubt that I am. And I can't doubt that I'm thinking now about me. I can't doubt that I'm sitting here thinking. So he put it in a, uh, in a uh, little sort of uh, first statement. Cogito, cogito ergo sum, or cogito ergo sum, I'm not sure, but you, you probably, the G is probably hard, I'm not sure. I think, therefore, I am. That was very nice, very uh, pleasing intellectual statement, because Aristotle, 2,000 years before, had already said that the deity was thought, contemplating thought, that what moved the universe was thought, contemplating thought. That, that was really a, a very beautiful intellectual statement. Whether it's true or not, I don't know. But that's how Aristotle put the first principle of the universe, thought, and no one's ever done it uh, any better. So that's why he was justly famous throughout the, uh, throughout the ages, Aristotle. And that's why we speak of an Aristotelian universe because he tried to observe and tried to get first principles and he tried to do it in a rational way. So Descartes just pushed that along with that. I mean, it's not a final statement. He may be wrong there. You could say, I sneeze, therefore I am. You can say, uh, you know, I blow my nose, therefore I am. Why? Because the minute you use the word I in any statement, you are assuming the fact of your existence. So actually, you've assumed your conclusion. In other words, you said, I think. Well, you've already, uh, you've already implied that you exist. You say that, uh, I got up this morning, therefore I am. Yeah, well, you've already implied that you be. So um, Descartes only put it in the most elegant way possible. Anyway, that's the only thing he said he couldn't doubt, finally. I don't know, lots of other things you probably couldn't doubt either, but he, he felt that was the best first principle. Whether he got anywhere with that system of his, I'm not in a position to, to say, but the idea of systematic doubt is something that we found in our world intellectual outlook. So you'll forgive me if I don't accept a religious document at its face value totally, whether it's Koran, Talmud, Bible, or what have you, because first we have to evaluate its credibility. In a university, that is. Not in a, now in a mosque, that's a different state. But in a university, you're going to the university, you're getting a degree from California that says that you're an intellectually rigorous person. You're not exempt from this. I don't care what religion you are. And I do that in my Islam classes, too. And they understand that finally. They come to a Western university because they want a Western educational system and they want that to be a rigorous one. When I was in Iran, when I was your age, and I was going across the Persian desert, Every time the bus went up a hill, everyone would start shouting, Allah, 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 inside the bus, hoping that it would get to the top of the hill and go down the other side. Uh, you know, that's lovely for human spirituality and comfort. But that's not what I want when the uh, 767 takes off. You know, I don't want you to be shouting uh, your God's name to make sure that that plane is going to take off and land. I want you to be shouting Descartes. <laughs> I want everything in that airplane to have been tested to the nth degree. I don't want any metal fatigue. You know, I don't want any, you know, wires that heat up and then blow up above your head someplace. 
you know, uh, I don't want any cracks in the in the outer skin of the airplane and so on and so forth. You know all the possible problems. I want even the ones that you can't foresee. So we don't want that to happen. I don't want your um, I don't want your Mac computer battery to suddenly start burning up on your table when you're sleeping and uh, set your bedroom on fire. You know. Hope you guys are getting your new batteries from the crooks. <laughs> You have the right to send them back. In any case, what I'm trying to say is that, uh, you know, so we do have a right to say things. So talking about Muhammad's work, he was a good poet. I give him that. He was, a, from an intellectual academic standpoint, he was a, actually uh, a spellbinding poet. Now, the Muslims don't like that because they say, no, no, he wasn't a poet, he was a prophet. Fair enough, he was a prophet if you like, but he was from Western appreciation, a good poet, a very good poet. Uh, uh, um, a uh, intoxicating poet, maybe unfortunately for the modern world too intoxicating for some people because you see how some people respond to his work, they get so intoxicated that they do things that are kind of, you know, um, frightening. I uh, don't put any more than that, but the point is that in his work he absorbed the Christian anti-Semitism that had already been passed down to him. That was not revealed to him by an angel, I can tell you that. That was in documents that were either preached, taught, or which he encountered. That is that the Jews killed all of the, all of the prophets. That is the worst um, accusation. And you hear every Muslim say that too. To, and Christians who read scripture say it too. Oh, the Jews killed all of the prophets. How many have heard that? Yeah. Well, it's in the corner around six times. And it didn't come from Gabriel. Like, if you say, oh my God, that's rising, that's blasphemy. It didn't come from Gabriel. Why? Because I don't accuse Gabriel of any untruth. It comes from people who never read the scripture for themselves. Because if you read the scripture for yourself, what do you find? How many prophets did the Jews kill? Oh, well, let's start the list here. Well, let's see. Where should we start? I don't. Let's skip Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, those people, because we wouldn't normally think that they're tribes, although they weren't killed by any by any Jews. Okay, let's start really with um, Moses, uh, Joshua. Let's go down to David's time. Nathan. You know, most of the people don't even know the names of these people, but they're all there. Um, see what I uh, let's see Ellie um, who's the one that uh, that, that anoints uh, assault Samuel I think these prophets killed a single one of them killed oh no no not a one uh, okay let's go let, let's keep on going uh, Nathan uh, let's see Amos Hosea uh, Micah Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, any, any prophets that we can uh, verify that were killed by any Jewish people? No, not a single one. Where does this accusation come from? Oh, just the scripture that says, is trying to say Jesus and John the Baptist are prophets and the Jews supposedly killed them. But even in those two cases, we'll find out that the Jews didn't kill either one of them. So, I mean, it could be that they have some involvement of certain Jewish party internecine strife in some of those, uh, in some of those situations. But anyway, you just go right down the list. Only one prophet there says a rumor that Zechariah was killed, well, not clear, on the Temple Mount between sanctuary and altar for some reason. That, that's in the apocryphal literature. It's not in the, uh, it's not in the straight biblical literature. That's the only one. So this thing, the Jews killed all of the prophets, what is that? I'm sure if you asked Mel Gibson about that, he would say that too. It comes right out of scripture, New Testament scripture, moving its Greek, its Greek intellectual idea of what the, of what the um, Jews did, and nothing would ever do with historical reality. Even if you include John the Baptist and um, Jesus, even if you include, that's not all of the prophets, not even a, even, even, even a fraction of them. But in the John the Baptist case, so here's where intellectual rigor comes in. Did Muhammad therefore display any knowledge of these things? No, of course not. So where is he getting these um, slogans from? Well, I know where he's getting them. And it's not heavenly. It's not heavenly. So you say, how dare you say that, Professor Eisen? Because I'm an intellectual academic teacher, that's why. And I follow Descartes. 
and I follow Newton, and I follow the rules of modern intellectual uh, uh, rigor, and, uh, and, and, and I'm never going to back off on those things, and I hope never no one else in our uh, academic universe, not other universe, academic universe, ever is forced to back off of those things. So um, even John the Baptist case, it is very clear that the Jews didn't kill John the Baptist. In fact, as I told you from Josephus, so I'll read it to you now that I have it with me here. I think I should read it right off to you since we're going to be talking about and are talking about Josephus theoretically. I hope I find it here. I brought it here. I got here. I have it marked somewhere. Let's see. Uh, chapter 18 of the Antiquities. <laughs> please, please, please. Let's see. Here we are. Um, uh, Herod the Tetrarch makes war with Aretas, the king of Arabia, and is beaten by him, also concerning the death of John the Baptist. So this is the Antiquities, chapter eight, uh, uh, book 18, chapter 5. Um, talks about Aretas. You're the most modern. You ask Muhammad who Aretas was. He wouldn't be able to tell you. Um, I, you know, Aretas is the king of the people in Transjordan. He's a so-called, we call Arab king. Paul is related probably to him. But in any case, Herod certainly is related to him. And uh, he is actually what we would now call the king of Petra. How many have heard of Petra? Well, if you saw the Steven Spielberg movie, uh, Indiana Jones and uh, The Last Crusade, how many saw that? That's not it was filmed in Petra. That is Petra. But if you want me to draw you a little picture, here's a little picture. This is easy enough here. Okay. So this is Trash Jordan over here. It's Dead Sea, Jerusalem. We've all been doing this here, uh, fighting up here someplace. This is where that, they're all, all the shelling and everything was going on over the last uh, uh, month or so. Uh, over here is Jordan. I just shot some people here in Amman. You know, Amman is uh, also in the Old Testament, you know. It's Ammon, the Ammonites. And it's just the same name brought down to the modern period. So this would be the Ammonites here, but they're already long ago gone. This would be the Moabites here over here. And down here is what we call, uh, we have lots of names for them, but actually Petra is over here. Petra means what in Greek? It's the same word as Peter. And Peter means in Greek rock. Because Petra was carved out of rock. It was a canyon, uh, you know, a um, had been washed out by a river or whatever you want to call it between two cliff sides and it made a perfect sort of defense place for caravan stops. So the caravans that came up from down here like this would shelter from brigands and other things here while they rested and then some would go over to Egypt and then others would continue up to Syria and on into other places. So it was a perfect sort of stop-off place after a grueling uh, ride across the desert. And the people who controlled it got rich from that because they paid, they charged a stopover fee <laughs> for anyone who was there. They got, to, they got, they had to pay. And so out of those proceeds, they built these beautiful <coughs> rock uh, palaces, temples, uh, um, building. How many are familiar? How many have seen that now? Carved in the, carved in the rock. Well, when you go to Jordan, and you don't want to go without a bodyguard of some sorts these days as a Western tourist. But when things do calm down and you can go and you can go again, there's been some shooting near Petra too. Um, you'll be able to go in there and see it. I've got a lot of pictures. I've been there and uh, done that, and uh, it's really quite spectacular. I may show some slides one day of that. William. In my book, I have uh, some pictures of that so uh, that, that I've taken, so you can look at it. Anyway, this King Aretas. It was his daughter that Herod the Tetrarch was married to. Now all of that's not explained that well in the gospel picture of the death of um, John. 
but it's explained in great detail. What happened was, uh, this other woman, who was known as Herodias, that is the female form of uh, Herod, had been married to someone else. According to the Gospels, it's Philip. Uh, but according to Josephus, it isn't Philip. It's a guy actually who was called Herod. And Philip was married to her daughter, Salome. And uh, again, there's discrepancies that we'll have to work out. Have to work them out. I mean, you say, well, the gospel's correct, right? Of course, because they're the word of God. Well, I mean, if the gospels are based in any sense on Josephus, then they may not be the correct one. Josephus may be the correct one. So, um, further along here, I don't have it marked in this one. It says here that uh, Philip died childless and was married to Salome. And if you look carefully, even Muhammad, at many points, he tells the story of, 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 of Joseph in the chapter called Joseph in the Koran. And he says, she who would ask a favor of him, Joseph, when he goes down into Egypt and is sold into slavery, she who would ask a favor of him. What's the problem there? He doesn't know her name. He doesn't know her name. We know her name, Potiphar's wife. Joseph and Potiphar's wife. He doesn't know her name. So he's clumsily always saying, and she who did want a dish from him. Yeah, because he's heard the story somewhere else, either orally or he read, had someone read it to him because it's supposed to be on letter, or he read it if he could read it all. And then that was some time ago. And like all of us people who have uh, bad memories, he can't remember the name. So we just got to say, oh, you know, uh, <laughs> you know the one I'm talking about. She who has the favor of him. You say, what do you mean? Yeah, because he says it over and over again. He doesn't know her name. Now we know that Herodias' daughter was who? Salome, right? Because we've got operas. We've got famous paintings, don't we? About Salome, don't we? The problem is the New Testament doesn't know her name. It, you say, oh, come on, it's there. Oh, no, it isn't there. They say, well, how do we know it? <laughs> from Josephus. Josephus tells us what Herodias' daughter's name was. The New Testament, you check me out. You check me out. You say, well, I saw the numbers. Like they knew. No, no. They may not have known. Uh, I'm going to put this closed here because it takes more battery like that, and I want to be sure to, whoops, that we have enough. Um, so, yeah. So let's finish this account in Josephus quickly to see if the Jews killed John the Baptist. Okay, however all the rumors might, uh, might be and all the hideous propaganda and slurs that come out of all these things. About this time, Herod is king of the Arabs and Herod, meaning Herod the Tetrarch, uh, he's the son of Herod, and Herod Antipas he's called, who read our Josephus had married the daughter of Aretas, and had lived with her a great while. But when he was once in Rome, he lodged with Herod, that's the other guy, this is really, guy's really called Herod, who was his brother, his half-brother as it turned out, but by another mother. For, the, his, uh, for uh, this Herod was the son of the high priest Simon's daughter. However, he fell in love with Herodias, that is, this other, this other Herod guy's wife, also a son of, uh, Herod had ten wives, the great Herod, and he had an innumerable number of children, someone like the Saudi royal family now. And uh, so this man ventured to talk, uh, her, who was the daughter of Aristobulus. I don't want to bore you with all this stuff, but you see the um, detail. So uh, Antipas, that's the Tetrarch, when he had made this agreement, sailed to Rome. When he had done that, the business he went on and was returning again. His wife, having discovered the agreement he had made with Herodias, that, he would, that she would leave the other guy and come to him, uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, sent his wife away and so on and so forth. Let me get to the point here. So anyway, when finally, um, oh, Aretas, Aretas' daughter was his wife. So he sent her away uh, in, 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 in um, the context of the agreement that he made with her to come to him and leave her other husband. Uh, so uh, he's, uh, uh, 
According, Harold sent her thither, as thinking his wife had not perceived anything. Now she said he spent a good while before to go to Macareas, which was subject to her father. And Macareas, by the way, is where John the Baptist was ultimately executed. Uh, Macareas is over here. It's a, it's a fortress here. I don't know if I'm spelling it right, but something like that. It's a fortress. I have a picture of it in my books, too. It's an artificial uh, hill that Herod had constructed with a palace on top. But the Maccabeans had first used it, and then um, uh, uh, Herod used it as a prison for, uh, for bad people he didn't like. And then his grandsons or his sons used it also. <coughs> anyway, so he sent this woman away to bed. Um, blah, 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 blah. Let's see, let's see. Uh, so Aretas made, the, made this the first occasion of his enmity between him and Herod the Tetrarch, who had also had some quarrel about other matters, geographical matters. See how detailed all this is? It's so detailed it's almost impossible to follow. But that's uh, Josephus. He's got an encyclopedic memory. So to make a long story short, they both prepared for war, sent their generals to fight instead of themselves. And when they joined the battle, all Herod, uh, the Tetrarch's army, was destroyed by treachery of some fugitives, who, though they were of the Tetrarchy of Philip, that's another guy, joined with Aretas' army. That's here how Philip comes into this. That's the third son of Herod. So Herod wrote about these affairs to Tiberius, who was then the emperor, who, being very angry at the tent made by Aretas, wrote to Vitellius, the Roman commander in Syria, to make war upon him and take him alive, or bring him in bonds, or send him his head. That's where the head of John the Baptist on a platter comes from. They just moved it over to the other story. It's all in this story. It's the emperor telling the governor of Syria to send him the Arab king's head because he's angry that he's making war on one of his subjects. And here's the point about, uh, you know, in Josephus. All this has been called by the New Testament writer, in my view that is, and put in the form that we have it, which is the most popular form, and therefore we get the idea that the Jews killed John the Baptist. Now some of the Jews thought that the destruction of Herod's army came from God. That Herod, the Tetrarch's army, which had been destroyed by Aretas, was from God. And this very justly. So the Jews were supporting John the Baptist, according to Josephus, not against him. As a punishment for what he did against John, known as the Baptist. For Herod slew him, though he was a good man, and commanded the Jews to exercise virtue both as righteousness towards each other and piety towards God, and so come to baptism, for that immersion would be acceptable him if they made, made use of it, not in order to put away or remit sins, which is the way it's put, baptism up for remission of sins is what's put, but he says it's not for remission of sins. Now you're going to have to say, well, you're something, something's wrong somewhere. But for the purification of the body only, supposing the soul had already thoroughly been purified beforehand by the practice of righteousness. So you purify your soul beforehand by the practice of body. So what do you do the immersion for? Bodily sins. That's in the, in the Jewish style. You know, you, you, you copulated the night before, or you come in contact with something impure. You, it's a ritual immersion process almost on a daily basis, and all these groups will practice daily, daily ritual immersion, or what we would call baptism. Now when many others came in crowds before him, they were greatly moved by hearing the words, Herod feared lest the great influence John have of the people might put it into his power and inclination to raise a rebellion, for they seemed ready to do anything he wished them to do, thought it best by putting him to death to prevent any mischief he might cause, and not bringing himself into difficulties with the people by sparing a man who he might later repent when it was too late to, uh, to do so. Accordingly, he sent a prisoner out of Herod's suspicious temper to Machaerus the castle that I just mentioned, and there put him to death. Now the Jews were of the opinion that the destruction of his army was sent as a punishment upon Herod and a mark of God's displeasure to him. <laughs> well, and that's from a Roman stooley, you know, who was actually in the Roman service. Who is uh, who is uh, writing in order, you know, for various reasons? So here, and he usually is in his fourth time. So again, what can I? What do I? First of all, Herod killed John for the reason that uh, is um, 
And by the way, he, you say he doesn't mention Salome. No, she's not part of it. Later, he mentioned Salome and said Herodias' daughter was Salome, and she was married to Philip. And uh, Philip died childless, so she went and married some other guy. I can tell you who she married. It's all, and that's what the that's the detail. This antiquities is. Let me see if I can get you the Salome thing here just quickly. I'm sorry to bore you with this, but. This is the problem of uh, 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 the unexamined life. Someone said the unexamined life is not worth living. Let me see. Is uh, Alexander? No, that's a different one. Slow me different slow yeah, yeah, that's an ancestor of hers. That's in three generations prior to that. Here, granddaughter of her, and uh, let's see, let's see. Let's see. Salome, Salome, Antipater, daughter of her, no, no, there's some, I guess it's this one, uh, 185. Four, eighteen five four. Okay, eighteen five four. And Herod the Great had two daughters, Mariam, uh, uh, Mariam and Salimso. Uh, they all married their cousins. By the way, we'll, I'll talk about Herod's brother, who et cetera, et cetera, married this other person. Uh, um, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Well, it, oh, here it is. Um, but Aristobulus, the third brother of Agrippa, married Yotopata, the daughter of Samson Garus, king of Emesa. They had a daughter who was deaf, whose name was Yotopate. And these hitherto were the children of the male line. But Herodias, their sister, was married to Herod, the son of Herod the Great, who was born of Miriam, the daughter of Simon the high priest, who had a daughter, Salome, after whose birth Herodias took upon her to confound the laws of her country and divorce herself from her husband, while he was still, um, whilst he was still alive, and married Herod Antipas, her husband's brother, by the father's side, and he was tetrarch of Gaudi. But her daughter Salome was married to Philip, the son of the great Herod. There, there, there he, he, he sort of gets it all out for you. Uh, it's complicated, and this is a, you know a poor translation and so on. But this is where studying starts to be interesting. And I'm not trying to criticize. I'm just saying, hey. So now we, I know I was too, I was better when I just described to you. Anyway, that's all in chapter 5 of book 18 of the Antiquities. It's encyclopedic. This is the vast number of stuff. Say, well, how did the Gospels get their presentation of it? Oh, I think after a generation or two, and fed by the, by the desire to make things look as bad as possible, um, because they wanted to, it was Paul and Paul's Gentile mission that had survived overseas. They wanted to make the events in Palestine look as, you know, lurid as possible. And then finally, also, um, they, the writers of the Gospels themselves hadn't understood that the Herodians were not Jews anyway. That they were Greco-Arabs, as I told you who had been slightly Judaized, and that the people didn't like them, that they'd been put on over, over them by the, by the Romans. So they didn't know this. So they thought that the uh, Heru, Herod, whoever they were, were Jewish kings. So therefore, if Jewish kings killed someone, then the Jews were responsible. So, you know, it's a very unsophisticated, very superficial view of it. Well, that's what I'm trying to say. I'm not blaming any of these people. I mean, just read the newspaper accounts to, to today if you want to see superficiality. It's just that this is how people, things get reported after they get second, third, fourth hand through different, uh, through different uh, retellers and so on. And finally, the basic facts of the story are obliterated and something else emerges. But Josephus is here, and you can doubt him, but I think on these things he is uh, pretty, uh, pretty firm. So let's go back to the conclusion there. Herod, who was hated by the people, was worried that John was so popular among the people that he would suggest to the people to lead an uprising against him that was going on constantly. So not only was John not an anta antagonistic to the Jewish populace, I don't think he sell, yelled at them, you generation of vipers who told you to flee the doom of the common, and so on and so forth, and made it look like he hated the populace. I think that the people were in awe of him, considered him a great leader, 
an extremely uh, interesting uh, uh, inspired person and probably a prophet. Okay? And that Herod, that is Herod Antipas, the son of, uh, of um, the great Herod, or Herod who had many wives, uh, who was insecure, wanted to marry this other woman, Herodias. Why did he want to marry this other woman, Herodias? Because she represented the main Maccabean Herodian line. I'll explain that to you. At some point, I'll do the genealogies for you. She had all the money. She was the principal uh, princess, if you want. So he thought that by getting her, he could uh, get a straight line into uh, the kingship of the whole area like his father had had, instead of just a tetrarch. You say, well, what is a tetrarch? What is a tetrarch? A tetrarch is a fourth, as you can see. So what they had done is he said he was tetrarch of Galilee. So his area, as we see, this Herod, known as Antipas, known as the tetrarch, He's the second generation after the original Herod, had control of that area there. The Roman governor had Jerusalem. There were two other areas, over here someplace and up here someplace, that I can't outline for you. But that's why the country or the area was split into quarters. And no one, that was when after Herod died, and therefore, this is around the year 30 AD, Jesus' time. And that's why no one had uh, total control of it. And uh, these guys all wanted to return to total control of the area if they could get it. The Romans had sent out a governor because of uh, a lot of uh, problems after uh, the death of Herod in 4 BC. A lot of uh, revolutionary activity broke out, a lot of unrest and so on. 7 AD, as I told you, they sent out a governor. Well, all this is in Josephus. So there's two books of Josephus. I told you the Antiquities, which is more detailed, and John Baptist not mentioned in the war. I don't think he felt comfortable, comfortable enough to mention him at that point. The war was written right after the, the war in 73. Antiquities was written 23 years later in 93 when he felt more comfortable and uh, more secure so because he had been involved in the war and people were probably making accusations against him and he didn't want to be as forthcoming as he later became. Any case, John is a popular leader among the Jewish populace. I'm not talking about the upper classes that were put in power by the Romans and the Roman governors and so on. Among the mass and Herod, who was an alien king in large degree, uh, was afraid of um, John. But there's no dance mentioned and there's no Salome mentioned. And the beheading has to do with the, I think it has to do with the previous sentence in the description where the Roman emperor asked him to send the head of the Arab ruler who was causing all of the trouble. This becomes Salome dancing, a sexy dance, and um, uh, a head being put on a flatter. And we've seen that head on a flatter now for 2,000 years. We've seen that head with blood dripping out of it and, and ooze and gore and everything. I said, well, where'd they get that? Where'd they get that? You'll have to decide. You are the one who will make the final conclusion to yourself. But I can't, I can't tell you which you want to finally hope to. But the point is the Salome is not in the scripture. And the person who Salome is married to is the wrong, is, is the wrong person according to the um, scripture. So there is a huge contradiction that you'd have to work out. Let's go back to what started me on this, the original accusation. So, at least in the case of John the Baptist, you cannot say that the Jews killed John the Baptist. There's just no way you can say that. There's an Herodian puppet governor, uh, tetrarch of Roman uh, auspices, who's put in... in power by Roman authority who is unpopular with the Jewish people, who is responsible for that death totally because he's afraid of it and his behavior was terrible. But the mob is not responsible for that death. Now that leaves only Jesus. So you've got one prophet that all these accusations are based on in scripture and in Corinth. 
And for that, we hear 2,000 years later, over and over and over again, upon uh, on a job and all these people like that, because it's in their holy books, yes. I have one question. Then. Sure. The part where the Jews uh, in the Quran killed all of the prophets, mm -hmm. that, it's not in the New Testament. I where, where they killed all the prophets, or in the New really Testament, it's just John. No, 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 it's in Paul. Well, Paul's accusations are really too. It's in uh, it's in Thessalonians. And it's not in the New Testament, no. Uh, for brothers, Thessalonians 2, starting from 14. For brothers, you've become the imitators of the churches of God in Judea. He's talking to the Greek community uh, in northern Greece, Thessalonians. Which are in Christ Jesus, because you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen, even as they have done from the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and do not please God, and are the enemies of all mankind. Now, that's the actual fact of almost every single bit of it. What was that? The Thessalonians. What was that? That's the one, Thess the one Thessalonians two fifteen. That's where it starts. In other words, now you say, Paul's correct. Paul's correct. <laughs> we'll discuss whether Paul's correct in due course. Maybe he is. That's something that we'll have to say. But you want me to know where the act who killed the Lord Jesus and all their prophets. And now they are persecuting us too. Now, the point is that they are. The Jewish Christians are persecuting the Gentile Christians, not persecuting. They want them to observe Mosaic law. And Paul and his group don't want to observe Mosaic law. And uh, so the, court, the, uh, the key question, and that's clear in, in um, Galatians, Paul says, you know, um, he goes on to talk about um, taking the law upon yourself, not taking the law upon yourself, the sign of the law, good or bad, circum circumcision, with, uh, I don't want to advocate or not advocate such a thing. But that was supposed to be the sign of the covenant. These are religious uh, symbols. And Paul says, don't circumcise to his uh, communities in Galatians, because then you must observe the whole law, because you've taken the covenant upon yourself. And uh, so finally, the theme of, uh, of um, Galatians is uh, to circumcise or not circumcise. I can read you the, the point here, uh, which is uh, relevant here in Galatians. So why am I reading Paul first? Because Paul's letters come before the Gospels as we have them. We don't know when the Gospels were put in their final form, but we do know that Galatians was written around 50 A.D. So he says here in Galatians, starting in Galatians 3, uh, well, first of all, we have those passages in Galatians 2. You see about Paul calling Peter a hypocrite. Uh, and the whole thing has to do with circumcision there again. That's in, uh, that's in uh, Galatians 2. But on the contrary, Galatians 2, 7. Seeing that I was charged to the gospel to the uncircumcised, and Peter to the circumcised. For he who worked in Peter towards the apostleship of the circumcised also worked in me towards the Gentiles. So he sets himself up as a counterpart to Peter in his, as it were, Gentile mission. And when they saw the grace with which was given to me, James, Cephas, and John, see now we don't know at that point since he speaks of Peter in 8, but Cephas in 9, whether Cephas is Peter or not, but it doesn't matter, uh, we'll just leave that and assume it is. These pillars gave the right hand of friendship, of fellowship, to Barnabas and myself, that we should go to the Gentiles and they uh, to the circumcision. Only ask that we should be sure to remember the poor, which I was uh, very intent on doing. Anyway, the poor is a name for James. It's all very complicated. The James here is not the James you're thinking of. It's not James, the brother of John. It's James, the brother of Jesus. James, the brother of John, has disappeared from the scene already. And this is James, uh, the leader of the early church, as far as we know. In any case, uh, I can explain that to you another time, I already have mentioned it to you, but uh, for when Peter, the poor were the, we know, were the, uh, were the uh, followers of James' community. It's in, if you see these in all the early church history, these were called Ebionites, after the Hebrew word Ebion, which means poor. 
uh, James is too many were called the poor, and that's why I like this, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls, because the Dead Sea Scrolls refer to themselves as the poor. And they don't mean uh, poor in, in, in theological doctrine, as Eusebius, 300 years later, likes to make jokes about them. They're poor because they follow a, a, a poverty re, uh, regime. But when Peter came to Antioch, I, say, I set my face against him because he was greatly to be blamed. This is where, um, this is where uh, Augustine is writing to Jerome. For before some, some came from James, he was in the habit of keeping table fellowship with Gentiles or eating with Gentiles. But when these some from James came down, that is from Jerusalem, where James was the head honcho, he was afraid of the party of the circumcision and drew back and kept himself apart. James's party was the party of the circumcision. And this was the leadership of the early church at this point. And the rest of the Jews, in the movement he means, also played the hypocrite with him. Hypocrisy is the Greek he uses. And even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy, by their hypocrite, by their hypocrisy. So Paul is criticizing them all, particularly the Jews in the movement, and Barnabas, and Peter. But when I saw that they did not walk uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, the gospel as he preached it, as he said, I said to Peter in the presence of all, if you, being a Jew, live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, why do you force the Gentiles to live like, like um, Jews? And then he goes on uh, for three or four chapters in his theological approach. In uh, chapter 3, he goes on about uh, the meaning of, uh, of, uh, of Christ's crucifixion. And then finally in 321, I'll just sum it, uh, um, this, is his, this is his view of things. It's counted in the letter of James. He says, uh, for instance, he quotes Habakkuk 2.4, the righteous shall live by his faith in, in 11. This is also in the Dead Sea Scrolls, in the Habakkuk commentary of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And he analyzes it, the letter of James analyzes it in different ways. But Paul says, Christ, in his view, redeemed us from the law's curse, meaning that the law curses certain infractions. So you don't want to be in a situation where you're under a blessing and a curse, according to the book of Deuteronomy. That's really what he's getting at here. So, you know, Christ did away with all that, and now we don't have to worry about that. So don't take it back on again. It's a powerful dialectical argument. It's dialectics. It's theology. It's rhetoric. It's rhetorical. Um, it's, re it's rhetorical uh, polemics. And it's very, very powerfully done, which shows Paul is very well trained in uh, um, Grecian, sophistical, and dialectical uh, rhetoric. And that's why he's so good at it. But the people he's arguing with are not trained in that way. Look at the Dead Sea Scrolls. There's nothing like that in it. And so this is very Hellenistic, but not very Palestinian. Anyway, as he goes on, why then the law? Uh, it was added because of that, uh, that uh, transgressions until the seed to the promised ones, etc., etc., etc. Is the law then against the promises of God? Oh, no, let it not be. For a law, if a law had been given which is able to give life, indeed righteousness would have been by the law. So then this is the rest of chapter 3. He goes on to show that righteousness is not by the law, but by faith in um, Jesus Christ. So these are his arguments that he lays out in favor of his faith doctrine. And Galatians, it's also repeated to some extent in more detail in uh, Romans, uh, is a, a very good uh, presentation of it. But he finally comes down to his attitude towards the law. Look at this. This is in chapter 4. Uh, he calls the law a slavery in uh, the first part of being a slave. But because you are sons of God, sent in the spirit of God, uh, and crying Abba, so you are no longer a slave. Uh, but you are like a son and an heir of God through Christ. It's all very elegant argumentation. Not no one says the opposite, but it does show you what the arguments were. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if you are a son, you are an heir. But indeed, not knowing God, you were a slave to those who by nature are not gods. But now that you have known God, or rather been known by God, wordplay, uh, how can you turn again to the weak and beggarly principles, there's a play on the poor, to which you again desire to be enslaved, meaning the laws of Moses. 
So that's quite an insult to the law of Moses for someone who claims to be reading Old Testament scripture. He calls the law of Moses weakened beggarly principles. So he's arguing with the Jerusalem leadership, not with the Jewish people. He's arguing with the Jerusalem leadership over these issues <coughs> who want circumcision to be carried out because he wants the new converts to come in under the law in order to be heirs to the promises of the law, which include the messianic promises in their view. For you carefully keep days, months, times, and years. I am afraid of you for fear that somehow I labored in vain regarding you. So Paul has been working overseas against these things. And he calls the things, you know how Jews, well, are, what were they coming up now? Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Shavuot, feast days and things. He calls these poor beggarly principles. Keeping, he does, he's not, he does not overt these things. He's very, he's very careful the way he does it. So, you know, he's very careful because he knows people are watching him, but he, it's clear what he said. Then, he goes on to say, and, 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 and you know through the weakness of the flesh, um, uh, he has some weakness somewhere, and you despise me in the flesh, therefore he doesn't appear to them in the flesh, he maybe has leprosy or some other disease, it's not clear what he has. But what's your unhappiness really, writing the Galatians, what's your, what's your beef? I tell you that if possible, you would have picked, plucked out your eyes and given them to me. And I, but I have become, have I become your enemy by telling truth to you? <coughs> There's a, a huge thing. Have, uh, am I your enemy? In other words, reading through it, people, someone has been telling the Galatians that Paul is the enemy. That Paul is their enemy. And Paul counters that by saying, I am telling truth. Is this made me your enemy? See, the people who have been saying this, he says, and they are zealous after you, but not uh, rightly so. They are zealous to exclude. Uh, and uh, they desire to keep you so that you may uh, be... Uh, 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 anyway, I can't give you the exact translation. It's confused in Greek, but he refers to zealousness three times. So it's quite clear that his opponents are zealots. He's playing off the words, uh, and the zealots are the party who caused the war against Rome, who are zealots for the law, and so on and so forth, who show the zeal of Elijah and Phineas, as is put in the Old Testament. So this is, uh, this is what it comes down to. Then he gets into this very important uh, 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 thing about uh, the law. Now tell me, you guys, who want to be under the law, 21 this is. Do you not hear the law? That's in the book of um, that's in the book of uh, Genesis. He calls that the law because the Jews called the first five books of the Torah the law. The Pentateuch was called the law by them. Do you not hear what's in the law? So he tells the story of Abraham and Hagar, but he tells it in his own tendentious manner to support the rhetorical arguments and polemics and and and, and, and polemics he's advocating. This man he put presents this. Words have been written that Abraham had two sons, one a slave woman and one a free woman. I told you about this previously. But he that was out of the slave woman was born of the flesh. And he was out of the free woman was born through the promise. Now this is already taking it to a spiritual ethereal level. This is not the actual story in the Old Testament, as any of you have read it know that. Which things are allegory, he said. What I'm doing is allegorizing. And he actually says that in Greek. Who's the great teacher of allegory in the ancient world? A writer called Philo of Alexandria, who is living in the previous generation to, uh, uh, to Paul. And uh, he, he does everything through, he's a Jewish writer in Alexandria, and he takes all the scripture allegorically. So Paul's just adding his presentation of allegorizing scripture here. I think he comes right out of the school of Philo here. In any case, you'll have to decide for that for yourself. Okay. These are, there are two covenants. The first is Mount Sinai, which brings slavery. It's pretty insulting to anyone who at that time can imagine that's why they so hate it. I mean, anyone's going to come around and say, you know Mount Sinai? You're just a bunch of slaves. I mean, I can, if I walk into the Crystal Cathedral and say something like that to them about what they're doing, I mean, they'd be ready to just beat the living daylights out of me. So obviously, someone writing like this, though, it doesn't hurt you because you don't have a, a stake in it. But the people at that time, if they saw this, they'd 
They'd be like out of their minds. Go into Bin Laden's camp and say these things about the Quran to him. You know, or Muhammad or something. You wouldn't have your head left. Draw a cartoon of Muhammad. All right, okay. Just coming here. So in any case, uh, I, I don't know. Yeah. But in any case, th this is really, this is amazing that he, that, that we don't feel offended by it, but they would have. I want you to understand. That's what all the antagonism is, is over. These kinds of statements that you think are beautiful rhetorical flourish, and other people would say, oh my God, he's insulting me. So here it is. But it goes further. That, that, that one from Mount Sinai, which is slavery, this is Hagar. But the Jews don't say they're descendants of Hagar. Who do they say they're descendants of? Sarah. Sarah, Sarah is, the, uh, is the concubine wife. That uh, Hagar is the concubine wife that the Muslims say they're descended from. In any case, Hagar, Sarah objects to Hagar and wants her thrown out because she's jealous of her like any other older woman would be of the second wife that's pleasing the old man. So uh, there's a problem there. But he switches it. He says, he says uh, what is from Hagar brings uh, Mount Sinai, which brings slavery, and this is Hagar. And Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. He knows where Mount Sinai is. He calls, so he knows that she's an Arabian woman. And answers, but it, it corresponds to, that's the allegory, to the present day Jerusalem, which is un, in slavery. But you see, the present day Jerusalem is only in slavery to who? Rome. But he says, that's not bothering him. He doesn't care about slavery. Rome says the present day Jerusalem is in slavery to the law, the Mosaic law. That's what's bothering him and with her children. But the Jerusalem above, the spiritual Jerusalem, the one I care about, the mother of us all, that's the one. But brothers, uh, we like Isaac, are children of the promise. So we're the Isaac people, the Jews are the, uh, are the Hagar people. But then, etc., 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 he was born according to the Spirit, he was, so as it now. So what does Scripture say? Throw out the slave woman and her son. For the son of the slave woman shall not inherit. So then, brothers, are we not the children of the? Are we are not the children of the slave woman? We are uh, children of the free woman. Well, that is the most huge bit of gymnastics, polemical and logical and rhetorical gymnastics you will ever encounter in any document, and very successfully done for those who are don't have a stake in it, you know. But for anyone who knows the actual history, this has turned history on its ear. It's just a total reverse. So who is the slave woman? Hagar. She's been thrown out by the free woman who is the mother of Isaac, who is the mother of all of the Jewish people. But he says no. <laughs> he says we're the, the free women are us. The, we're children of the promise because we're free of, of, of the, of the uh, law. So okay. What I'm trying to show is that's what the argument is here. And I think I'm proving my case. At least that's it. For in chapter 5, in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor lack of circumcision is anything uh, but, uh, but faith working with love. It should show a bit of love himself. You were running well, but who kept you back not to obey the truth? Now, 10, 5, 10. I am persuaded to you that you will have no other mind in the Lord, but he who is troubling you, you will bear judgment. Those people are bothering you. So, brothers, if I still preach circumcision, why am I persecuted? But he's not teaching circumcision. In any case, it shows that that's what he's being persecuted for by the others in the church. Then the stumbling block of the cross has stopped being there. I wish that those who were causing you with themselves, who are troubling you like this, would themselves cut off. That's it. That's it. What does he mean? Those people who are coming to your community saying you must be circumcised, in order to come in under the promises of Moses. I'm not saying you are, you aren't. I'm just saying that those people would have thought that way, just as a Muslim today would have thought that way. He says, I wish they would themselves cut off. What's he mean? A pun on cut off. He wished they would their own sex parts cut off. It's a dirty, ribald joke on cutting their own, excuse me, gonads off. He can be pretty nasty when he wants to be. So, uh, <laughs> I don't know how we got on this subject, but the point being here, the point being here, it has to do with what he says in, in uh, Thessalonians. He gets really worked up. He's got a terrible temper. In Thessalonians 2.15, therefore, he says those things. And it's clear the people who are, who, who are making the um, trouble are not the Jews so much themselves, but the party of the circumcision within the church who are the party of James. 
that is as Paul sees it. So then we come to uh, the problems that we're going to have to face, which is um, scripture. But the reason I read you that was to show you what is causing this problem by those who think the law is binding and those who don't think the law is binding. Sorry to get off on these tangents. Next time, we actually will now stop all this and go through the history. Start to bring your um, harmony of the Gospels, if you have it, or your uh, uh, a Greek, uh, or your Greek um, interlinear too. And if you have your Josephus, I'll finish up Josephus next time, and then we'll start on just going through the scriptures. If you haven't read Paul, you can see he's very interesting.